It'll be fun. All right, you ready? Yeah. Here we go. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fourth Page Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Jones. My guest today, the one, the only Michael Booth of the Booth Brothers. Hello, Michael. Hello, Danny. Are you glad to be here today? I am super glad. I'm curious about this. This is this is kind of new. How many of these have you done? Well, this is the first one. <laughs> There's always a guinea pig, and, and that one is ours right there. Yeah, okay, this will be... So we're not necessarily sure this is actually going to get out to the public. That's yet. very possible. <laughs> but if there's anything we've ever wanted to try uh, with a person who can handle anything that's thrown at them, it's you. Yeah, I, darts don't bother me. That's right. Of course, the year 2021 has been a big year of oh. change for the Booth Brothers. Yeah. Uh, coming out of 2020 into 2021, uh, I've never seen anything like this in my entire career. But... Uh, yeah, when we shut down, if you will, I think it finally proved to Ronnie that he really does like being at home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he came to me and uh, eventually said, Bub, I just don't want to do it anymore. I don't have the heart for it, and I want to go home. And, you know, a lot of the people on the inside of gospel music realize that this was not a decision that just happened because of the pandemic Mm -mm. this was something that ronnie had been dealing with for two or three years prior yeah i think he wrestled with making this the decision for two or three years but i think it had been brewing for many years this traveling thing you've done it it's not for everybody um you take an introverted person and put them in an extroverted world night after night, after, especially the, the amount of touring we have to do in our, in our genre. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if we could have kept it to 60, 80 dates a year, it might have lasted longer. Um, but he needed, he's a homebody. He mm-hmm. likes being at home. He does. And, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to travel with the Booth Brothers several times. Yeah, we across got great the stories. We do, we've got great <laughs> stories. We really do. And we might even share one yeah. or two of those in a little bit. But Ronnie was always the one who, how many how many hours do we have before we get home? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, now we're this is our last program for the week. Do we need to stop any yeah. other than fuel you know he was he was always the one who would ask those questions and you're right ronnie was a homebody and loved it yep he was great at what he did on stage and was committed to it yep. while he was there but mm-hmm. when time came for him to say i'm done he made yeah. a decision and you don't look back because you have a great replacement oh. in the gentleman by the name of buddy mullins buddy mullins what a what a gift he has been and one, one of the things i love so much about buddy is he's 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 so passionate about this thing. Um, his energy level is off the charts. His desire to be involved, which quite honestly, it's it's different for me. Um, Jim Brady and Paul Lancaster have been, and Joseph Smith prior. Those three guys were were wonderful in their. They look and they say, "Hey, if you need me, I'm there." Uh, and they're willing to work as hard as anybody. Uh, Buddy is like, "Hey, what are we doing next? Mm-hmm. Let's let's go. Let's let's talk about it. Let's figure." Because he has been a group leader um, with the Mullins. Um, also, he runs Hope for the World, um, his ministry that he so he's used to being a leader. So we're working together to figure out how to how to use his skill set and his energy along with me uh, having to lead the group and i'm i welcome it i welcome it one thing that's definitely changed in the past when ronnie was on the bus you would control the stage Mm -hmm. ronnie would take care of the business it's a little bit of the george johns glenn Payne thing that made the cathedral we took the same model right well now roles are beginning to reverse somewhat you'll always be in you know involved in what's going on stage but now you've mm-hmm. got buddy who's also can help a little bit with that but now all the business in is suddenly in your lap and i know what grades you made in school dude you're not kidding it sounds funny but it's it's not uh i don't like it i don't i don't like how it distracts me mm-hmm. from 
what I want to be focused on, and that is the music and the message. Um, and, and Landon Bean called me when all this went down. He's like, Michael, just be careful because it can stifle your creativity, it can stifle the ministry, it can stifle, because you have all this on your mind. I rarely have much time for the music and the ministry part of this now. I do believe it'll get better. Mm-hmm. But I'm having to get, look, when, when we said I ran the stage and Ronnie ran the money, he ran them. I didn't stick my nose in it. I, I, I didn't know about reconciling checking accounts. I didn't do that. But now I, I have to know about these things and payroll and taxes and all these. It makes me appreciate what he had to deal with all those years. It's know? almost like aging. Mm-hmm. Suddenly life begins to shift and everything has a different perspective. You know, we have a mutual friend who's who has passed on now, Dave Edwards, who um, had the Breakfast Club in yeah. Florida for so many years. And the Booth brothers, especially in their early years, worked many of those many. dates. And I recall you telling me one time, uh, one thing that Dave Edwards always impressed upon you was to take care of yourself and yeah. keep your health good because there will come a day when things change on you. Yeah. Interesting you said that. Let me let me take a, a journey around and come back to that. I called the great Steve Green um, just not long after Ronnie. Um, actually, I don't I don't think it was long after he Ronnie and I left the attorney's office where we signed the papers and did all the business stuff you have to do. Um, and I called Steve. I said, Steve, what do I do? How much do I pay for? You know, and as far as help, he said, Michael, anything that distracts you from your, your being a father and a husband and, and your message, he said, those things matter most. So keep those the priority. And he said, now it may take you some time to learn the, 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 the scope of the business to find out what you can handle and what you can't. He said, but keep that in mind. Take that and add to it. I remember when we were working with Dave Edwards, he would say, man, if you got your health, life can be good. If you don't have your health, life can be really hard. So take care of your health. Be careful with the traveling and all that. And uh, you put it all together and these This is one of the great things about our genre is we get to hang out with these people that have walked this road before us. Mm -hmm. You know, Dave was right. Steve Green is right. All I got to do is pay attention and do what these guys have told me. Uh, You mentioned um, Dave and health and singing to those people. That was a senior crowd. When he made the comment we're talking about, I was in my 20s. Right around 29, 30, 31, something like that. Nick, no, 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 no. Late 90s, Nick Bruno brought a song to me that the Kingsman used to sing called Look For Me At Jesus' Feet. And I said, that's great, Nick. That's great. Not interested. I didn't like it. I didn't get it. For five years, he pushed me to record that song. And to be perfectly honest, I recorded it just to hush him up mm-hmm. because he kept put. he said, Michael, son, listen to me. I'm telling you, this is a great song. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Me and all my great wisdom and experience. I ended up saying no. Finally did it. We recorded it. Six months went by, never staged it. Dad kept telling me, he said, son, you need to record, you need to stage that song. He said, trust me. So I finally staged it just to hush him up. And the first time we sang it was a homecoming in Plant City, Florida. You may have been there. I'm not sure. Plant City, Florida. I sang Look for Me at Jesus' Feet for the first time. And the reaction from the crowd, I thought, I still didn't know what was going on. I just thought, wow, there's something here. Yeah, I was there, and I remember the look you on there. your face. Yeah. And it was like, okay, what? something just clicked, but what am I missing? What am I missing? And I think you and I actually discussed it a few weeks later, a few months maybe. And the thing that you were struggling with then was it just seems like an older person song. Hmm. But now, as you've gotten older yourself, how do you feel about that song? I hadn't carried enough caskets. 
hadn't stood by enough gravesides to appreciate that song. Mm -hmm. Eternity to a young person who has had a, now, look, there's some kids in 13, 14, 15 years of life have had more tragedy than people in their 80s. Okay, so it's not just because they're young or just because they're old. But typically, a person who's lived 40, 50, 60 years has now experienced enough life to realize how quick it can go by and how good things can be and how bad things can go. And then you start appreciating eternity more than you ever have. And that's what happened with that song. I sang it for a, a long time, still not getting it. I had a gift. God, you got to understand what gospel singers, we're not putting on. We're just using the gift God gave us. And I would communicate the song like I really didn't know what it meant, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. But eventually, you know, George Johns left, my grandparents, um, my uncle, that was a big one. When, when Carrie Uncle his, Charles. Uncle Charles. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was pretty tough carrying that casket. Um, that's when it really started dawning on me. Man, am I going to see this guy again? Mm -hmm. yeah. And now you sing the song nearly every night. Yeah. Rarely a night goes by where you don't sing it. Yeah. And um, everything takes on a different feel when you actually live the song. Hmm. And like you said, you, you can you can put into the song on stage sure everyone knows how to do that but when it but when it moves from here to here yeah that that's a big moment so speaking of big moments you're in the middle of trying to wrap up uh, a new album yeah. with buddy mullins mm -hmm. you're trying to uh, rebuild the stage set and you're not taking any additional medication i'm very <laughs> proud of you i thought about it Thought about it. I right? thought about it. I'm right. not kidding. I did think about it, but but I thought, no, I got, God can deal with this. He, he'll, he'll get. And it has been hard. I I got in such a groove with Ronnie and Paul and Jim, that it just got, it was really easy. I gotta be honest, it was really easy mm -hmm. because with Ronnie there and Jim or Paul coming in, we had this core songs of I mean Christ alone and and blind man and then I'm at the master and feeling for all these things that Ronnie took the lead on uh, recent years uh, three wooden crosses or stuff like that and and Ronnie didn't sing you know interesting you look at the set list he didn't sing a lot a lot of solos but when he did they mattered right big time and especially my biggest thing is that opener uh, I, it, it didn't bother me to follow any group at any time because I knew I had Ronnie and his voice to go out and sing some mid-tempo, probably Mosey Lister thing. And Ronnie and a song like that separates us from any other group. Um, and, and it helped wipe the slate clean. That was my biggest concern when Ronnie left musically. So how, how are we going to follow Collingsworth now? How are we going to follow Triumphant? How, you know. Um, but one of the things interesting, Ronnie came into the studio. We've recorded two albums. We've recorded one. I guess you could call it a table album. I hate using that word because it sounds like it's less quality and it's not. Um, uh, and then we're working on a Stowtown, Stowtown album for mm -hmm. national distribution. The, the first album, Ronnie came into the studio with an arrangement of a song right from his mind of what we were going to do had he stayed with us and we open with it now and i'm trying to think of the name of it <laughs> <laughs> i know the name but i'm just letting you sweat oh my gosh don't, don't uh, shall we gather at the river thank you Very shall good. we gather at the river and you hear that arrangement it is one thousand percent ronnie booth if you ever wanted to know what did ronnie contribute to the group musically when it came to arrangements that's right in the gut of it so what can we expect on the new Mainline Booth Brothers album? You know, let's, let's do some real talk here. Um, there's a shift and a moving in our genre of people reaching out and trying new progressive, if I may use that song. They're trying, you know, most of the people that go to church now, like it or not, there's a guy in jeans with a guitar leading the worship and a band. It's not a choir. It's not a piano. It's not a, it's some churches, but, but in large part, 
the music has shifted. So I'm I'm seeing big groups take what I call quantum leaps in their style. So I'm happy to let them take quantum leaps. I'm going to let them go knock down some doors, get their nose busted and black eyes and then and, and and progress and and do all these things that need to be done. Um, now's not the time for the Booth Brothers to be trying too hard to to stretch. So all that to say, uh, what can we expect? Much of the same, but here <laughs> it's taken me a long time to make this point. When you remove Ronnie and put Buddy in there, it's gonna change right drastically. Uh, it sounds. It's, Ronnie's voice was so big and full and mellow and country-ish sounding, but he's is not that. So it's naturally, even if we sing the exact same kind of material, it's going to have a different flavor to it. And that's why I'm even more careful to not try to do anything too progressive moving forward. Exactly. So. All right, we're going to come back with uh, Michael Booth on the Fourth Page Podcast in just a few moments. Uh, stay tuned for more of our visit with the only man in gospel music who is reorganizing a major group during a pandemic. <laughs> Lucky me. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Fourth Page Podcast. I'm Danny Jones of Singing News Magazine. Our guest today, Michael Booth. Before we went to the break. And before, before you had just had to redo that, because he just messed it up prior to this. I just want everybody to know. <laughs> it's, it's a little intro. He turned it like Elmer Floyd for a minute. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. And I hope you have enjoyed the fourth page <laughs> podcast with our former guest, yeah. Michael Booth. No. Okay, let's, uh, let's go back to uh, something we alluded to before we went to the break. Advice. You have been watching as the the shift has taken place in Southern gospel music that seems to be going on right now. And I know along the way, in the 30-plus years of the Booth Brothers, people have given you advice. You've asked for advice, but you've also been given advice uh, without asking. Of all those pieces of advice that have come your way, what would be something that you would pass on to the younger artist of today? Let let me clump two, three people together, Uh, Bill and Gloria Gaither and my dad. Dad and I were just two days ago talking about this subject of of styles changing. He said, son, I remember seeing a shift in the 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 40s and 50s to the 60s and 70s and then the 80s, 90s, and, and such as that. He said, if you took the music from the 40s and 50s the way we did it, and tried to do it in the 70s, 80s. He said, you know, you could get by with it. He said, but it wouldn't necessarily be that well accepted. And, man, people get all up in air about this subject we're talking about right now. Right. But there is a reality that styles change. Listen to, all right, right, take your Mark Trammell quartet, really traditional quartet, one of our best ones right now. Play their CD and go back and play the Statesman and Blackwoods back in the 40s and 50s, and you'll hear what I'm talking about. It's a a huge change. Now, right now, people would say, well, Mark is the benchmark of traditional. Um, That's that's where music should be. Well, eventually, one day, that's going to be left behind, too. We cannot avoid it. So here's the advice. Um, Dad taught me this. Gloria Gaither said the same thing, and I'll put them together. Up applause doesn't mean you're being effective. People are kind, and they're gracious, and they're nice. They want the person on stage to, to do well. Even if they don't love the music, they're like, eh, it's okay. What separates the men from the boys is those who can discern, have I really reached that crowd? Has the, the song, the message, and the spirit really connected with the people beyond the noise and minutiae of the applause did it get to the heart the ones who can figure that out are the ones who will consistently communicate and impact an audience and second thing a uh, third person bill gaither said never operate on a person unless you can sew them back up mm. right so in your transitions of speaking and the songs you select to go with what you're saying 
Make sure you don't leave a person wounded and open without sealing them back up with the hope that is connected to this particular song you're going to be singing. Wise words there. Yeah. And uh, now that you're in your mid-40s, rapidly <laughs> heading toward 50. I'll be 50 in a couple months. Yep. Yeah. I was trying to be kind. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, there it is. Right. <laughs> So as a 50-year-old tenor singer in Southern Gospel Music, Ooh. what is your ultimate goal? Where, where do you want Michael Booth, the performer, to be at when the year 60 rolls around? Oh, where do I, where, 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 where do, <laughs> easier to say than do, right? Mm -hmm. Where do I want to be musically or vocally at mm -hmm. 60? Yep. Uh, I'm preparing for that now. Uh, believe it or not, actually, I started about 10 years ago anticipating it's interesting you use the word 60 I was anticipating in my early 40s where my voice might be in my 60s and I started arranging things to where um, I started bringing things now look Booth Brothers have never been high singing stuff like Gold City and Kingsman and stuff we've never done that one of the reasons is all of my high notes, and I don't want to get into a technical thing, but they're all wide open, full chest voice. Well, you can't, you can't sing C's and D's night after night unless you've learned to develop a mixture type of tone between the head and the chest. We won't chase that rabbit. I never did that. Therefore, it wears me out to be wide open, just pounding on the big high notes. So I, two things. I started to develop that mixture voice in the last few years. And I started bringing songs down slowly. Now I'm telling all my secrets. Mm -hmm. But I started bringing them down slowly and putting my solos closer to a lead singer range so that when I am 60, and I may or may not be able to do what I did when I was in my early 40s, no one's gonna know. And here's why I think that's important. Um, when you're struggling, it can become a distraction. Now you're losing the impact of your message. So I would rather not be a hero and swing for the fences and play it safe over these next few years so that when I can or can't, no one's going to know. They'll just know that what I'm doing is effective. Again, words of wisdom. I, yeah. And these are words of wisdom coming from a guy who has a track record uh, being not so much wisdom, <laughs> not so much wisdom, <laughs> incredible practical jokes that uh, have been the victim of many, many times. You're pretty and, much and, all the victim. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of other victims, but but it really is amazing. Yeah, let's be honest about it. Traveling like the typical group does, all that time where you're just literally sitting somewhere yeah. waiting to get to the next destination yeah. can allow for minds to wander too quickly yes. and by that I mean what can I do to really make his day memorable what can I do to mess up his normal routine yes. and Michael Booth is one of the best at doing I'm those kind of things yeah and you're very spontaneous too like uh, oh like the day we were at a restaurant in Myrtle Beach South Carolina it's become a bit of a legend. It's a legend story. It, it has. and uh, You keep getting the numbers wrong. I'll correct you if you get it wrong again. I don't know. I'm, I'm not real sure that I'm wrong on the numbers. I'm confident you're wrong. Well, here, here's the basis of the story. We were at uh, an event in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, singing in the sun, and yep. uh, every year it just became a tradition, mm -hmm. if you will. We would always go to lunch, me and the Booth brothers and a few other friends, we would always go to lunch on the day that the Booth brothers were in town. Always the same restaurant. Yep. It's a Mexican restaurant over there. One day we're there, and uh, when the meal is finished, the, the waitress has brought all the checks and laid them out there. And um, I'll, I'll excuse myself to go to the restroom. And then I made the mistake of leaving my check and some money with Michael uh, to pay my bill in case mm -hmm. the waitress came back. Well, when I was on my way back from you the— said you said, take care of this for me. And you put a $50 bill in that little black wallet type thing with the bill. I right. said, I will do that for That's you. That's right. And I've never used that phrase again. <laughs> so on the way back from the restroom, I met the waitress. She had a big, 
big smile on her face. Tell her why. Well, because you had only gotten like a taco. Yeah, like six bucks yeah, maybe. I don't. There's no way your bill was over ten dollars. No. I think I remember correct. It was about eight eight dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you would put a 50 in there. You've been telling people it's a 20. It wasn't a 20 because it wouldn't be as funny. That's This is why I did it, because you put a 50 in there. It puts a $50 bill in it. And I thought, that little girl is working really hard. She <laughs> she deserves a really good tip, and I'm going to help her with it. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, she, he did. She came by with for his $8 bill and that $50 bill sitting in there. I said, he said, keep the change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That little girl's and, in that little girl's in college now because I of me. No, it was the most awesome thing. Well, now, now payback did come yeah, around. Yeah, I we, knew that was coming. Yeah, we were in Missouri probably three or four months later. Very, very hot day, and if yep. I remember right, after sound check for you guys, the air conditioning was not working right or something. There was something it was making hot. it even worse than it what was it was. Hot. It was like 112 degrees outside, 100% humidity, no yeah. chance of rain, that kind of thing. So you and I and uh, Robert Dixon, who yeah. was the sound engineer for the group at the time, we got in my car and we drove across town to Sonic. Sonic. And as you know, if you've ever been to Sonic, they've got these big, tall uh, drinks, Route 44, is yep. what they call them. And they have this thing, which you can't say the word, but people think it's a, it's a called happy hour. I right. think it's everything's called happy ha- Yeah. Everything's and, like a dollar. Yeah, half price or whatever it was. Yeah, it was so cheap. We've, we've got three of those large drinks for like two bucks, something yep. like that. Yep. Michael's in the back seat. And he said, here, boys, I take care of it. And over my shoulder comes a $20 bill. Yes, I did. Yeah, you did. Right. So you the did. ratio was about the same. I walked right into it. Yeah, man. you did. I, it was a good one. <laughs> of course, this is also the same guy who tricked me into driving the Boost Brothers <laughs> Boost, uh, bus rather for, oh, like eight hours. <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you what happened. <laughs> this was back when we were... You know, now it's DOT regulations and CDL licenses and all that, which you have. I don't. But back then, we're, everybody's driving. I'm not sure why you were on the bus. We asked you to help us. or mm-hmm. ri- We were going to be at some events together. Every, every date was 700 miles oh, between yeah, yeah. each other. Very long. So I think this was the first night. Uh-huh. And it was. we leave. I'm guessing this is probably 8 o'clock at night we leave. I'm guessing. Right about 10 o'clock. I say, hey, Danny, I, I need to go to the, the restroom. Now, what y'all don't know, of course, never do this now, but you can just hop up from the, the driver's seat and someone slip right in there. There's so much space in the bus. It's not. Right. You can't do this in a car. No, you, you don't, don't do it in a car. I said, Danny, I got to go to the restroom. We, yeah, man. I said, yeah, here. And so we slip out. Danny slips in. He's driving. I go to the restroom. And I walk out of the restroom and I think, Man, I'd like to go to bed. I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs> and he did. I did. I didn't say nothing. Right. I just got my pajamas on and went to bed. And I slept like a baby. That bus drove so smooth. How long did it take you to realize what had happened? Oh, I doubt that you had even made it to the restroom when I realized what you had done. Okay. <laughs> so I, I just settled in and for eight hours. Just took it. I he just, did. I just drove. I got up the next morning, you were still driving. I'd slept six, seven, eight hours, whatever it was. That's yeah. right. That's probably why you found a snake in your bed later yeah, on. Yeah, I know. Hey, uh, you know, you did, you did you did a similar thing to your dad, and oh, you did not tell him about it for almost for 30 years. Years, I didn't tell him. So we had bought, uh, remember Palmetto State yes. Quartet, uh, Jack Pittman owned a bus. He sold us the MCI. Great bus, by the way. Uh, the, the Lewis family owned right. it before them. Anyway, so we're driving up I-75. Um, it's just me and Ronnie and Dad back then, just three of us in that big old bus, and and I'm, Ronnie drove the first shift, so this means he probably pulled over probably at the Flying J exit to Georgia on I-75. Mm-hmm. So means Ronnie had been driving for probably four hours, okay. And then I was going to drive, so it's about one o'clock in the morning. So I get in, I I, I drive the bus from Flying J, I get on the interstate. I had no sooner squared the bus up in that lane. Dad walks up in his sleeping attire <laughs> and says, 
son, are you tired? Now, he's right here, and I'm driving. I can't, we're not looking at it. He said, son, you tired? And I said, yeah, Dad, I'm exhausted. <laughs> he said, pull it over. I said, okay, thank you. I drove one exit. <laughs> one exit. <laughs> yeah. Which, one exit, went back to bed. Yeah, and uh, never told his dad for the no, longest time. I bet Ronnie was thinking, why is my next shift up, son? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now we know why Ronnie left the group. Oh, right. <laughs> no. oh, you know, everything with the Booth brothers, it always seems so in control. Uh, e- even the funny moments, you know, you, the group has always had a mastery of the stage. But well, there's always been one thing that has uh, been a little bit of a, a funny moment with me is knowing the inside story, knowing how uh, Michael thinks, knowing how Ronnie would think. And uh, listen, there were no harsher critics on the Booth Brothers than the Booth Brothers uh, themselves. We've gotten a little better over the years. You year, have, but, you have. Man. But I remember one night at the National Quartet Convention, this was when it was in Louisville at Freedom Hall, and on this particular night, the building, if it was not full, it only missed it by a few seats. Booth Brothers go on, absolutely destroy the place. I mean, people are throwing babies, they're <laughs> ripping chairs out, throwing, I mean, it is a big moment. Nobody has seen anything like this. and in quite a while big big moment I happen to be sitting in what is known as the pit which is that Mm -hmm. little area around the stage where artists who are waiting or or guests are waiting while the next group comes on and um, so here comes Ronnie and Michael down the stage you cannot hear anything going on because the applause is so wild the crowd's wanting more and everything Ronnie gets down at the bottom of the stage he shaded pitch one time the whole night and he's, I am never singing again. I am done. I am <laughs> never going so back. Upset. And Michael was the same way. Yeah. Well, yeah, what's interesting, I look back in that now, um, I don't know how to explain it. All that zones out. You, yeah, you know what's going on, but you don't hear it. It's silent in your head, even though it's deafening, you know, with the crowd screaming. That was a big old crowd. And I remember it. It They were responding really well. Mm-hmm. Um but it's silent, in my, and, and what we're, in our minds, we're lining ourselves up with the greats of vocally how they would present themselves. And we knew we had fallen. Now, we had, though we were effective, we, we did not sing well, and that bothered us to no end. That's all we could focus on at the moment. What we had to learn, what we had to learn often in those big moments, the adrenaline is so great. Um, you're not on your sound system. You're not hearing real well. You know, you're trying so hard. You're not going to sing real well. Some of, but it is what it is. It is what it is. And it, but it was. It still amazes me to remember that scene. I was uh, devastated. Oh, you were devastated yeah. that night. I, I felt like I was going to have to go on suicide watch you or something. You used that term that night. My gosh, I've never seen a group go over that well and have to put them on suicide watch. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, walk into the exhibit hall and you cannot move because of the line of people yeah. waiting at the at the Booth Brothers table. Meanwhile, Ronnie's trying to make phone calls to sell a bus. It's <laughs> over. It's over. So, That's hey, our true. guest today on the Fourth Page Podcast has been Michael Booth of the Booth Brothers. Looking for great things from uh, this trio of Michael Booth, Paul Lancaster, and now Buddy Mullins. Uh, so stay tuned. Lots of great things in store right here on the Fourth.